Hello, everybody. Welcome to this special conference. We have an important guest that I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy and learn from her. Um, our speaker is named Michelle Zimmerman. Michelle Zimmerman is the author of Teaching Artificial Intelligence, Exploring New Frontiers for Learning, published in four different languages. She is a Microsoft Innovative Educator Expert. She has taught students in all ages from 3 to 16. She received her PhD in Learning Sciences and Human Development from the College of Education at the University of Washington in Seattle. And her research since 2007 has been recognized with multiple awards. So welcome, Dr. Zimmerman. I wanted to thank you for having me here today, but I want to explain a little bit of context before you hear me speak. On March 14th, I was, I was happy to receive the vaccine injection for COVID-19. I've not had COVID-19 itself, but I wanted to protect myself and the students at my school by getting the vaccination. Unfortunately, I had a very rare reaction where my brain swelled and I wasn't able to speak, remember, think, move, or even get up and walk. I'm still having difficulty now with memory, with speech, and with being able to focus. The room still feels like it's spinning around me and doctors don't know what's going on. But I know it's by God's grace that I'm still alive. I know that he has given me purpose that there are still things for me to do. And speaking with you has been one of the important things that I wanted to get better for. So I thank you for your patience as I go through this uh, speaking engagement and knowing that there are dark times in each of our lives where things start to look hopeless and we don't know if we'll recover. But I want you to know that I believe it's a miracle and by God's grace that I'm able to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be able to talk about artificial intelligence and how we can see it in connection with our faith. We know that in the beginning, God created and he created us in his image. It's important to me as an educator and a researcher and someone who is invested in technology to understand how we can really express our faith and technology at the same time. We know that there's an ability to connect um, the idea of struggle and darkness with a sense of wonder, because in the beginning there was darkness around the land and God created out of something that seemed so dark and full of despair. Our lives can be like that sometimes. Not everything is easy, but there's a chance to be able to express a sense of gratitude and wonder through the times that are hard in our lives. A friend of mine um, pointed me to this quote, and he said it would be really important for educators. At first, I didn't understand how it connected to artificial intelligence, but the more I looked at it, I realized it spoke deeper to something about learning. It's not just about memory, Machines can remember things quickly. It's not just about seeing things or imagining, but it's about experiencing. In a moment where someone is experiencing, questioning his life and looking at the moment of his death, he thinks back to a time when his father showed him ice and he experienced it in real life. It's different than opening a textbook. It's different than turning on a computer screen. And it's something about emotion and memory that can make a difference. The reason I bring this up when I'm talking about artificial intelligence is because even though technology is advancing, there are things about us as humans that are not the same as technology. And I want you as educators to know how important that is. Your job is important. Your chance to interact with students is incredibly important because there's no way technology can replace you. I want you to think about the challenges in your life and the struggles you faced. Things that your students have gone through, you may not even know the depth of their pain or their sorrow, but you can be there to encourage them and give them a sense of wonder. No technology can replace that. As I researched about artificial intelligence, I wanted to understand the definitions. There are so many different ways that people are defining machines that try to replicate who and how humans act. Sometimes we think about them in terms of a robot, 
is a robot artificial intelligence? Can it respond like a human? A professor showed me this diagram and it helped me to understand the different aspects of technology and how they apply to the human world. We can look at the human world, we can look at processing, we can look at the interactions between robots, cognitive sciences, systems, and automation. All three of those different areas are getting more and more developed, but they don't talk to each other very well. Humans have a lot of capacity to move, to be able to think, to be able to process and respond to information in our environment. And machines are able to do maybe one of those things very well. So for example, a robot can move its hand and it can perform tasks in automation and never get tired. But at the same time, if a wire crossed its path, it wouldn't recognize the pattern of what it's supposed to do. Where a human would be able to easily look down, pick up that wire, move it, and then continue on with the process. So there are limitations to technology, even though it can do a lot of advanced things. One of the things that this professor at MIT explained to me is that when all three of those processes between the human world, cognitive spaces, robotics can all work together, then we would be closer to creating machine that is like a human. But still, there are aspects of humanity that can't be replicated by machines yet. Wonder is one of them. And I would argue that faith is another. In the beginning, God created. He created us in his image to explore, to wonder, to create purpose, and to have meaning in life. And that's something that you can help your students with. Sometimes people think stories in the past, in the Bible, are old and maybe not relevant to the future. But I wanted you to think about stained glass windows and the stories that they tell. They were able to reach people through different languages and time and space and tell stories. Those stories help us know something about who we are as humans. And I find this interesting because we look at the time of the garden, uh, the garden of Eden, and how perfect things were. Things now aren't perfect. We know that there's destruction. We know that there's chaos. We know that there's greed. There's selfishness. And there are things that feel like we can't get out of patterns that repeat over and over again. But we have the hope of the resurrection. It was recently Easter. And we can remember what God has done in our life, that there's hope for the future. I bring this in also because we can think about the impact these stories have on our lives, either just as thinking about them as a fairy tale or reality. Noah's Ark is one that shows us hope about a rainbow that was in the sky. And humans may not have understand the, stood the science at the time, but we know now that there's science in the way that the water and the light interact to create broken up spectrum of light that we see as a rainbow. But at that time, people didn't know about the beautiful galaxies that the Hubble telescope could show. And that's an example of the footage that we saw because of technology. It gave us a chance to see the glory of God in a way that our eyes couldn't have seen otherwise. And so it's maybe more than the rainbow that we imagined just from the story of Noah's Ark, but things that we don't know exist yet. And there are things that your students can help discover in the future that you may not have even imagined or even hoped to imagine, but you are the one who gives them a chance to start seeing these things. I like how we try to replicate some of the beauty of God's creation in architecture, in art and design, because not all days we get to see rainbows, but if we can have replications of them down our streets to remind us of joy and hope and God's creation, it gives us a chance to bring something of heaven down to earth. But at the same time, we also know that humanity can cause a lot of destruction for itself. Everything from um, keeping our environment safe to the people who are around us. And destruction can become um, a symbol for not just what we see with trash and waste and the environment, but how people treat each other. I want Alexandra to come to talk about some of the symbolism that she's seen in this movie, Wally, and some of the things that we've talked about in our class. Hace unos meses tuve la oportunidad de ver una película de Disney llamada Wow. En esta película, el globo terráqueo había sido destruido. 
a causa de los errores humanos y era irreparable. El presidente de la nación, líderes, le decían a la gente que deberían a subirse a una nave y viajar al espacio hasta, hasta que una legión de robots limpiarán el desastre que los humanos habían provocado. En el relato de la película, Eva es un robot que fue enviado a la Tierra a encontrar señales de vida. Su misión era encontrar una planta y enviarla de vuelta a la nave en órbita y hacerle saber a los humanos que era tiempo de volver a la Tierra. Esto me recuerda al relato bíblico de Noé y el arca, donde después de 40 días de un turbulento diluvio, Noé envía, Noé envía una paloma a buscar señales de vida. Y una vez que la paloma regresa con una planta en su pico, Noé confirma que la vida es posible y el diluvio ha terminado. El robot Eva en la película Wally representa a esta paloma, quien encuentra una planta, justo como en la historia bíblica del, ar del arca de Noé. En el mundo actual, debido a la pandemia y las restricciones sociales, veo que COVID-19 ha impactado la educación y a cada uno de nosotros de manera negativa y positiva. Hay mucha incertidumbre, aislamiento y una mayor adicción al uso de dispositivos inteligentes. La tecnología podría ser lo mejor que nos puede pasar. Podemos ir a internet, investigar y encontrar nuestra información. Lo, neg lo negativo de la tecnología, en mi opinión, es la adicción. En lugar de estar, pre estar presentes con nuestros seres queridos, elegimos dispositivos inteligentes y esto re reduce la interacción humana. Interacción humana. Creo que la educación es sensorial. Yo... ¿Por qué necesitamos involucrar nuestros cinco sentidos? Yo creo para aprender realmente debemos experimentarlo, como tocar, oír, ver, oler, saborear, en, interactuar con los demás y desarrollar la inteligencia emocional humana. Con inteligencia artificial estamos siguiendo patrones robóticos con el uso excesivo de tecnología. Por ejemplo, cuando esperen, esperamos que un mensaje de texto o emojis comunique volúmenes de emociones a través de unas pocas palabras. Mientras miro a mi al, alrededor y me, da, y me doy cuenta de nuestro estado actual en la pandemia y que el uso excesivo de la tecnología es grave. Espero que nos aferremos a nuestra amistad con Dios y, y recurramos a la sabiduría de las Escrituras y usamos la inteligencia artificial y educación para am amplificar nuestra fe, espiritualidad y el involucrar nuestros sentidos. Y de, y de esta forma evitar enviar una paloma o un robot, como la historia de la Arca de Noé y la película de Wally. Thank you. Oh, mi nombre es Alexander Díaz, yo tengo, yo tengo 12 años. Thank you, you did an excellent job. I'm impressed with anyone who can speak more than one language. Even though I studied more than one language, I can't speak it fluently. So it impresses me, especially when I have students who speak more than one language and she speaks three. She wrote the entire thing herself and she um, helped come up with the concept and then worked on the design of this presentation with me from the beginning. Storytelling can happen in many forms. It can happen visually. It can happen even through dance. 
our school uses dance as a form of helping kids know visual and spatial reasoning and skills in a way that we can't with other subjects. It seems very easy for a person to walk and move from one place to the next until they consider how technical it is to get a robot to have smooth movements. It's not that easy. In this example, the students were um, dancing and choreographing to a song called Stairway to Heaven. And they wanted to tell a story about despair and hope and hope for the future and what God does in our life. They used technology to research. They connected with each other through collaboration and created something with no words that would give a chance to share the hope what's in us. I sketched this design when I was looking at two younger students work with robots and they looked at it for the first time. One had a little brother with them. And the little brother was scared. Was it a good robot or a bad robot? Was it going to move? Did it come alive? I wrote about this in my book because I wanted people to think about artificial intelligence as more than just coding. Yes, you can teach children to code, but soon machines are starting to learn to code so quickly and easily that the basic coding skills that children will learn will adapt quickly. And if they don't learn how to learn, unlearn and relearn, it would be easy for students to say, but I don't know that coding language. We want kids to be able to be resourceful and know that as technology keeps developing, they have the skills to keep learning. I wanted people to see things like Wally because it's storytelling. It tells about something that looks like a servant, a robot to clean up the garbage and junk, things that people didn't want to do. But through that story, it helps humans to think about how to treat the environment, how to treat each other, and that with struggle, we start to learn to be more creative and productive. We learn to appreciate the things that we may have taken for granted early on and through the beginning. This is an example of an extension project that helps kids think more like scientists. They can use recycled materials and design a robot and imagine what that robot could do. This is an example of some of the pieces that the students used. It didn't allow them to use any adhesive or any brand new materials. So to connect the pieces, one of the girls used rubber band that she would use to put her hair back in a ponytail. Our school won a STEM Excellence Award and this astronaut Leland Melvin was the one who awarded it to our school. When he looked at the type of resources our school students had using recycled materials to create and design, to try and come up with challenges that no one had created yet. He said it reminded him of himself when he was a child. He didn't have expensive STEM resources or kits. He didn't have a school that gave him all the pieces and the steps to complete something. When he didn't have something, his father said, make it. It gave him a sense of creativity, a sense of wonder, a sense of with that struggle in his life and being poor, what could he do to start being creative? In the beginning, God created. He gave us the ability to want to create instead of just passively receive information. And because of that, those skills helped him, Leland Melvin, when he was on the space shuttle, when he was going to explore God's creation in a way that we can't see from standing on the ground. He helped us to understand more about what was created because of the skills that he learned, even when there were few resources. So as we teach our students to be researchers, to be scientists, to be artists and creators, we have them design their own process. The students in this project created the process for imagining what they wanted to do if they could go to space. We used artificial intelligence to translate it. It's not perfect. It's not like a human translator, but it gives an idea of how you can cross boundaries of space and time and help share ideas across different locations. You'll have access to this link and you'll be able to use this as an example if you want to try a project like this in your class. The program that created it is called Sway. Sway uses artificial intelligence and machine learning behind the scenes so that it creates the design and the format for students so they can focus on the content. We connected it with global goals for sustainable development to imagine what the global world challenges are like responsible consumption and production, um, and when they brainstormed, come up with ideas, they looked at each one of these 17 goals that the United Nations developed to try to imagine what could be beneficial in space someday. How can we create something now that would benefit us, but also look at something in the future? 
This is a group of seventh grade girls. They came up with, and eighth grade girls, they came up with concepts, used digital ink to sketch their ideas. And what we want them to do is not have something perfect the first time, but we want people to be able to practice showing failure, showing when something went wrong. How did you revise it? How did you come up with new ideas? What do you do when something goes wrong? And through that process, it helps students to be less tied to a sense of failure and giving up when something fails. In life, there will be failure. In life, there will be times that don't work the way that we expected. And if school only teaches students to produce things that are perfect the first time and get graded for it, they won't have practice of what to do when something goes wrong. It's not just for astronauts or people who are in the middle of really technical experiences where there aren't experts out there to fix it for them. This is an example of Minecraft where students modeled their designs and their investigation for this project, not only in digital ink, but then in Minecraft and then reflected on it. We've learned that reflection is a really important skill for kids to have as they're developing for technology. Without it, you can go through multiple lessons, learn over and over and never apply it. I like this idea of symbolism in a plant in new life because when you plant a seed, you don't know um, where that will go. You may know what the seed is and what your crop will be, but you can bring the ideas of technology and symbolism and storytelling from something technical to something in someone's everyday life. Thinking about um, crops and production and what different areas are known for. I know coffee is important to people in Seattle and they love Starbucks, but it's not grown here. Kids here wouldn't understand the same concepts as kids who are local to your area. You can connect some of the things that they know about growing coffee and planting with faith and with the scientific method. There's a parable that Jesus told to talk about the sower and the seeds. When you think about this as a symbol for faith, it's something that can tell a bigger picture of humanity. While machines can look at and replicate things, they're not good at symbolism and they're not good at storytelling and they're not good at applying those ideas to a new concept. This is one of the ways that we can help our students continue to be relevant when technology keeps advancing. When you're continuing with creativity and innovation and storytelling, you're creating a space that machines can't yet. When humans are able to teach other people and learn different skills, they're able to help um, produce new ideas and innovation. You don't have to have STEM kids to do this. You can have students try to model things like the water cycle and connect it in with the idea of seeds and planting and different processes what happens with different variables. And they can model it with drawing in simple things with paper plates and paper, but they can also use technology and look at water systems and irrigation and rivers. They can model it um, in multiple dimensions. They can look at different languages as they're processing some of those different water cycles and how it might relate to global goals of challenges that are much bigger than who we are in the classroom, but how they can start thinking about what they want to do to make the world a better place. You can see in this screen that we used OneNote and looked at the movie WALL-E. All the children from early childhood up looked at that same movie, but applied different concepts. By having them create with things like buoyancy and looking at water and how things float, it can give them ideas of different aspects of actually experiencing it, just like that opening quote. What will your students remember at the end of their lives? What will be the experiences that stood out to them? Not just the things that they took on a test, but those things that they actually touched and felt. It doesn't mean that you can um, do that in technology completely, but you can start supporting that creativity through technology. You can still draw on paper, but you can also use digital ink to tell stories. This is an example of looking at the water molecule with something like popsicle, I mean, toothpicks and marshmallows. So you can physically model a structure, but you can also use something like Paint 3D to model water molecule structures, even with early childhood students. This idea of growing and planting can go across different stories, bringing into faith, bringing into science and technology. Looking at close observation may seem basic for children, but it's still very important in an age of artificial intelligence. If they start looking at observation early on and drawing it, they're becoming better artists. 
but they're also learning how to create and observe just like the Hubble did to help us understand more closely things that we don't even know exist yet. This is an example of using computer vision. It's very different from the way our human vision works, but it looks at patterns and lines and drawing, uses computer vision to help a teacher assess problems so they're not multiple choice. This is from a professor in Australia, University of New South Wales named David Kellerman, and he's trained artificial intelligence with a lot of data. It takes a lot of data for a computer to remember, to see patterns, and to figure out how things fit together. But by doing this, he was able to have students use digital ink to write the problems and assessments. It saved time for the teacher's assistants to work directly with questions that are not repetitive. Artificial intelligence is good at helping with repetitive tasks. And in the future, there will be other ways that technology can support educators in helping students create new things that are not multiple choice and repetitive patterns, but can actually recognize some of those drawings and sketches. There are other ways that we can start having kids document their use with technology by creating videos making little mini documentaries as if they're scientists and showing the process of what worked, what did they try, what do they reflect on, and what failed. I talked about some of these processes um, as we look at architecture and nature and as those things combined. Um, my students looked at architecture that was inspired by a love for God, but also a love for nature and looking at different ways that structures can replicate the structures we see in nature like tree branches. The bottom corner picture is the students as they were trying to replicate a tree, the same height and structure with um, branches that extended the longest length of the student in the classroom, while also researching um, a specific architect, his history, his background, his family, and what inspired him through his faith. He didn't want the architecture to be like anything else. He wanted it to be different and unique, but still proclaim God's glory. You're able to see this video on YouTube if you would like to see it later, but you can see how it connects with mathematics, looking at science, volume, um, texture, the way the redwood goes, art, architecture. They practiced Spanish as English speakers. They collaborated with each other and their goal was to communicate this an idea that others could see how all the subjects combined. While artificial intelligence can create and it can solve math problems, it's not good at showing how math can connect with science and technology. In this way, they used the same Wally project looking at recycled materials and figured out how to use recycled materials to create this tree structure. They started from scratch, they documented the process, and then when they thought it was working just right, the whole thing fell down and collapsed. Instead of trying to hide that and only show perfection, they showed what they did to find out the problems, why the balance wasn't working, why they needed a deeper root structure, and they needed to change the center of gravity. They redesigned and rebuilt. Our lives are very similar. There are times where things will collapse, and it's our job to ask questions, what went wrong, what can I try differently, and how do I rebuild? The same thing happens for educators. In the beginning, God created. In him, you are a new creation, and you have the ability to make a difference for your students. I get teary-eyed because each of us goes through trials in life. And don't give up even when things get hard. It's important that kids see you creating and you being in the image of God so that you can give them a chance and hope for their future. It's not just about mathematics. But I want you to know that technology is incredibly exciting in giving us new ways to look at teaching and learning, to give new chances that you can have time that's freed up so that you can spend building relationships with your students. I'm teary-eyed also because I've been going through struggles recently too that I almost didn't live. And I know that God has a purpose for my life and he has a purpose for yours. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. I want you to know that you can know for sure I'm not a robot. Robots don't know how to cry. 
They don't know the depth of emotion, of joy, of being alive, when you could have been so easily dead. You have a story to tell. It goes far beyond technology. Your story goes through emotion, through humanity, through faith, and knowing that God has put you on this earth for a purpose, no matter how dark things get. He's giving you a chance to experience, to feel, to believe. Even when emotion feels hard, emotion shows that you're human. And through that humanity, you can give a sense of wonder, of experience, of exploration, and of hope. These are some resources that you can look at for more choices and more ways to bring in basic technology to your students. They're written in Spanish, and there are other resources that are coming soon, but for different technology roles in classrooms and um, different settings. So I wanna thank you for everything that you do for your students. I want you to know that you are important and you matter. Do you wanna say something else? Okay. Is it over there? To say thank you. Gracias. So, Dr. Zimmerman, uh, we have a short time for questions and answers, but we would like to know what the uh, what the what the audience is thinking about, right? Um, yeah. And we have a comment here from Lucia Ramirez. Thank you, Michelle, for your kind words. You're an amazing human being. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, would you like to wrap up something from your conference? Uh, just to say that you can teach coding, you can teach technology, but teaching AI is so much more. Um, to have your students be able to connect different subjects together will better prepare them for being on collaborative teams. The teams right now that are developing, creating AI need people who have background in all different areas. And Alexandra and I were talking about some things that are really important for people to learn. Do you want to add that? Like coding mm -hmm. um, is it English or Spanish? You can do either. Okay, well like, uh, sometimes coding changes, coding changes all the time. So sometimes you have to reprogram yourself, your brain, to learn all the new codings and just be flexible. Great. Um, what I read from your biography, Dr. Zimmerman, is that uh, not only you have um, uh, earned or like. Um, got awards from your research and your work at different schools, but also your students. Yes. Uh, they have been into different contests and uh, with your help and support, they were able to got other awards and um, prizes. Would you like to tell us more about that? Um, there are different times that I want my students to try competitions, not even because the goal is for them to win, but to know that there are times in life that things don't go perfectly. And I say to them, if you do win, then it's really exciting. If you don't win, you still learn something from it. So there were competitions that had them design the possibility of new games um, for different languages with digital ink and um, the creativity that it takes to combine those different subjects together were what helped them um, to win those competitions because it showed that they weren't just thinking about one subject or just about coding. It was about a design and concepts that went around those ideas. When people are trying to prepare young people to be in careers that are ready for artificial intelligence, it means they need to be good at different subject areas like the arts, to be able to understand ethics, to be able to understand different skill sets that would inspire or um, help create games that would get people to want to play them, but also to say what are the tools in artificial intelligence that will help develop this program to support humanity. And so when you get children and young people to think about those different things, instead of just uh, just coding or just science or just math, then you start building things that are more creative. That's great. 
Uh, we have another question from Andres Camilo Vélez. Thanks, Michelle, for your contributions. Do you think artificial intelligence will replace the work of teachers? That's an excellent question. I don't believe that artificial intelligence will be able to replace the types of things that teachers can do. Um, there are certain things like if they're just repetitive math problems, yes, artificial intelligence can replace repetitive math problems and scoring those math problems. It can replace helping people find the next level video or topic. But what it can't replace is teaching children ethics. It can't replace teaching children about faith. It cannot replace helping guide creativity and exploration. And that's why I focus so much on those aspects in my talk, because those are things that are human that cannot be replaced by machines. And those are things that people haven't been able to develop in machines that are like humans. Perfect. Um, let me see if we have more comments. Okay, I think in Spanish, we have more comments in Spanish. So we would like to, to see them through another place. Okay. Um, I, wanna, I, I want to ask Alexandra, about um, about your ability with different languages, including coding, right? See. So, so when was the first time you started like coding on a computer? Um, la primera vez fue um, como tres años. Um, creo que cuando estaba en esta escuela, las maestras me enseñaron cómo hacerlo. Primero, yo no lo podía hacer, estaba terrible, pero con práctica estaba más mejor. Qué bueno. Ok, we have more questions here. Um, Michelle, how soon do you think the advanced artificial intelligence is going to need to apply effectively the ISAAC? Asimov's law of robotics? That's a good question too. And I believe that part of the answer to that is dependent on whether it's general artificial intelligence or narrow artificial intelligence. The general artificial intelligence suggests that a um, machine would be able to respond with the same types of emotions and decision-making processes that humans do. And one of those would be to not harm humans with that machine. Where that becomes very difficult right now is that machines don't have the ability to determine um, an ethical decision or not. So even with self-driving vehicles, um, someone needs to program it to decide if a crash occurs, does that vehicle go into one car knowing that it could kill one person and then avoid another car? And if so, how does it decide which person is should die or has less of a chance of, is it benefiting society or is it that they're older, which brings up ethical questions. Machines can't do that on their own yet. And so the idea of machines not harming humans is not one example, um, but that at this point requires humans to develop those ethics, to code something into, to make those risk decisions. And um, that's one reason why I think it's important that young people learn about ethics and morals because their ideas and concepts will build into the design of whatever that artificial intelligence is. So if it's not at that place of general artificial intelligence where machines can make those decisions on them their, on their own, then it still requires humans. In terms of how long will it take until it gets to that point, I've talked with people who have worked in um, artificial intelligence research since the 1960s. And I asked them that same question, how long do you think it will take before machines can process like humans? And the most common response that I've gotten from the people who worked the longest in that area have said at least 100 years, because it's not just about the processing speed. Even though quantum computing is allowing computers to process really quickly, that's not the only thing that makes a machine like a human um, being able to process. There are a lot of complexities that make us human like those decision making factors. And some say they don't think it will ever happen at all. Perfect. And we have one last question from Julian Rodriguez. Michelle, how can artificial intelligence help teachers to differentiate in the classroom? That's an excellent question. And one of the programs that we use 
I know the image froze, so I'm sure many people didn't get to see it the last part, but there's a program for mathematics called Alex. And what it does is allows teachers to see very quickly any gaps in student learning. And so it allows you to group students by the skills that they're ready to learn instead of just by grade level. And that's a type of machine learning and artificial intelligence that helps grade and um, assess student work very quickly, much more quickly than a human could. And that's the piece that artificial intelligence can replace, the grading. Um, but at the same time, it can then send an alert to a teacher to say, these students are ready to advance. These students need more support. And that's a way that it can help differentiate in the classroom. Perfect, excellent. So I think all of these contributions, resources, and um, lessons from Dr. Zimmerman are going to um, have an impact in all of us as teachers. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman. And thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry for the inconveniences, but um, we're going to um, publish this video with the subtitles um, soon. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Hasta luego.